Hi noon. Welcome. Welcome to the OK Corral. Hope you brought your pist pistolas. Uh, my name is Derek Marabon, CEO of Ingenix Digital Marketing. And I'm up here with Stacy Collett from Dollar Bill Printing. The reason we're up here. I think so. Yeah, the reason we're up here is for Lunch and Armor Marketing, uh, your weekly marketing education series. And I think there's some people here, it's your first time. Any first timers? First time members? Okay, welcome, welcome. You know, it's great, it's amazing. You know, you bring on Microsoft, it brings different crowds. It really does. So that's cool, welcome. Just so you all know, we meet here every week on Wednesdays, and we always teach you something. We always have smart speakers. We do record it. Uh, Roger Rail records this, and we video stream it live. So if you can't make it in, you can watch it at letwim.org slash live. Um, anybody tweeting out there? And we encourage you to tweet, thanks, Don. We encourage you to tweet, use the hashtag uh, LA2M. Um, Lindsay Lackwell will be tweeting as the LA2M account today. So she does that as part of her service to the organization. Thank you. Uh, we are an all volunteer organization. We do have one employee, which is really great. We're a 501c3 nonprofit. Uh, Mary Lou Olds is our first employee to LA2M, which is really great. I mean, think about when like, the Red Cross started out, right? The first employee. Yeah, it's a big deal. United Way. Yeah. <laughs> they all started with somebody. We have Mary Lou. The rest of us volunteer, but she gets paid a little bit. So, yeah, yeah, Mary Lou. And so we pass the hat. This is how we fund our organizations by passing the hat. We suggest a three dollar donation. You're welcome to give nothing. It doesn't offend us. We're not watching you closely as the basket goes by. But if you want to put money in the hat, you're welcome to. And Stacy's our treasurer. She'll pass that. Uh, we just started a new scholarship program with Ann Arbor Public Schools, we're giving money to students who can't afford to go to different types of marketing and advertising programs, so that's where your money goes. It also goes to uh, pay for some of the administrative and overhead fees, so I'm just saying that. Um, what else, what else, what else? The format of this group, our speakers are gonna talk for around 30 some minutes. Uh, there might be time for Q&A, okay? And then at 12.45 uh, we do introductions where you get to go around the room and introduce yourself, and we'll pass the microphone so you can do that. And, um, oh yeah, our sponsor. Our sponsor this month is The Ride. Do you guys know The Ride? Everybody know The Ride? Okay, that's the Ann Arbor bus service. And the, the Ride is a new service to Detroit Metro Airport where it's $12 one way to take a really nice bus to Detroit Metro Airport. And uh, anything else I should mention with The Ride, Don? That's good, thanks. That's Welcome good. MyRide.com for more information. Yeah, MyRide.com. My so, are you right? My air ride. Oh, my air ride, yes. My air ride is the number for the, uh, the bus for the airport. And for any of you who work downtown, make sure you get a go pass. It's a really cheap bus pass if you have a business downtown. It's like 10 bucks for the year, you can ride a bus. So those are some real nice ways. This is Commuter Challenge Month. Uh, hopefully you're walking and biking and carpooling to work. So, make sure you do that, because we're trying to save the planet. That's part of our job being in Ann Arbor, you have to save the planet. It just, you live here. Or if you come to LA you must save the planet. So please do that. All right, enough for me, enough random balance. Um, this guy, besides being tall and good looking, look at this guy, he's a big guy. That's why he's in sales. But uh, he's one of my fraternity brothers. Can you believe that? Yeah, we were in a fraternity together at Michigan State University. Any Spartans out there? A couple, all right, go stay, good. Um, but Brad, Brad has done quite well for himself. He's a, he's a family man and he works with Microsoft. And these days he's doing the Xbox, which I'm very interested in. Any Xboxers out there or families with Xbox in your household? Yeah, I know there's a lot of you, whether it's the kids or probably a lot of you dads are big gamers. Um, but Brad's gonna show you how they market and how companies collaborate with Microsoft to communicate with people. So let's give Brad Mann a big round of applause. Welcome to LA Twin. Thank you, Derek. I appreciate it. And uh, if anyone wants stories from about Derek from school, you can hit me up afterwards. Or in the Q&A session, we have to share with you. But thank you to Derek and, and to uh, LA2M for having us in today, or me in today, to talk about you know, feedback. Is it me? Anyway, um, to talk about the what we call the war for the living room. Basically, how, how the console space has really changed the way that people are consuming entertainment. Um, so there were some hands for people that have an Xbox. Um, people that have an Xbox. Um, uh, other just consoles in the room. Just by a show of hands, if you would, please. Awesome. Hey. 
I, I can ask the question because when people think of the Xbox, what's well, the first thing that comes to their mind is gaming, right? Well, the reality of it is consoles are no longer about gaming. In fact, that's not even the predominant use of the console anymore. The predominant use of the console is entertainment consumption. We hear so much about Apple TV, Google TV, and Roku, and all these set-top boxes that, are, that people are using to stream content to the televisions. We forget about the, the sort of the, not only the leader in that space, but the originator in that space in something that was actually a game console in its early phases, but is now really an all-up entertainment hub for the family room, and that is the Xbox. And I'll try not to make this, this presentation about the Xbox. Um, it's hard not to sort of use our data, our data set here, because in the United States it really is the predominant console. But I'll try to speak to it more so from what the console is doing for the family room and how advertisers more, more, more specifically can actually reach their audience uh, through this medium. So I'll jump in quickly, give you a little, little information about the industry as a whole. So the console industry is actually a $17 billion business globally. Uh, so some of the predominant ones in the space, you see we Xbox 360, PS3, and even some of the handheld devices. Uh, these are global statistics, so when you look at the United States, the Wii uh, and the and sort of the Xbox in terms of shares is, is considerably higher. What I want to talk about is sort of that, uh, so you have the consoles in the space, that's great, but how do we reach people from an advertising perspective? Because ultimately that's what I want to talk to you about today. The, the Xbox itself, when you get it home, you pull, pull it out of the box, it's Wi-Fi enabled, it's, you know, it's enabled for uh, an internet connection, same with a, a PlayStation. Uh, the Wii actually doesn't really have advertising opportunities, so we can just really look at the PlayStation or the Xbox. In particular, the Xbox has over 40 million subscribers in, uh, globally. Uh, in the United States, it's actually 20 million subscribers. And we look at uh, the, the, the worldwide penetration, 35 countries globally currently have Xbox Live service. Uh, 11 of those countries having localized sales support. So what's interesting, obviously, I, being in Detroit, I work with so many of the autos. They're looking for uh, a single point of contact to fly a global campaign. And that's really how we're able to do it, using the Xbox Live service. We can run a campaign globally, but have it, uh, you know, have it change or respect it to the local uh, local languages or, or what the, the vehicles or whatever they want to have for the local messaging. How this is changing, um, we're seeing that the, the service itself, the Xbox Live service, um, for the last few years you've been able to, 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 to use the service on your smartphones, uh, not only just the, the Windows phone, but also the iPhone and even the iPad through a companion app system that we have. But you can actually now, uh, when Windows 8 launches later this year, you'll be able to use the Xbox Live service on your PC. So how does that change the, the market? Well, we're about 40 million Xbox Live users globally, about 70 million consoles. There are 550 million PCs running Windows 7. So you think about as people move to Windows 8, which is a touch enabled, a touch optimized uh, operating system, now you have the Xbox Live in there. People are gonna be able to have a consistent use across PC, their home console, and their phone and tablet all the way across. So that's really what, what consumers want. They want the ability to access content on the best screen available to them at that time. So if you're in a car, it's on your smartphone. If you're in a coffee shop, it may be a tablet on a plane, maybe a tablet or a PC or laptop. But you always want to be able to consume your content regardless of where you are on the best screen available to you at that time. And that's really how this is changing. And we're seeing similar things like that in the industry, of course. So let me just talk about the, the US. And I, I, I want to, these are, these are Xbox statistics, but I think you'll probably see very similar statistics from something like a PlayStation. So sort of give you an idea of who this audience is, because I think there's a, there's a general um, perception, misperception, that the gaming audience as a whole is this 18-year-old kid in their parents' basement. Uh, living off of Cheetos and Mountain Dew. And certainly, there are some of those people out there, and God love them, but yeah, the reality of it is, it's largely, um, uh, when you look at the audience, it's a much older audience than people would assume. Do you know, uh, Spice, uh, by some shout it out, what would be the average age of a console owner is? 37. 37? Very close. About 35. Right? And that shocks a lot of people. And they're like, well, why? You know, why? Why is it uh, so high? Well, you think about sort of the early early days, right? The consoles really 
from the Atari to the Nintendo. You know, that obviously that, that audience or those, those, those uh, consumers then have grown older, have a lot more consumable income, uh, uh, income now, and are able to go out and buy these devices. But the, the fact that the device itself has become this entertainment hub has allowed it to penetrate deep into the family room, and it's being used by not only the owner of the console, or maybe it's the adult, or the, the male in the home, but obviously now the spouse, the, the, the kids. This has become a very much a family-focused uh, device. So on average, 62% male, 38% female. It does change based on the activities. So if you look at uh, a lot of our dance and fitness uh, content, that's going to be more female-focused. If you look at uh, things like Hulu Plus and uh, Netflix, that's very much a 50-50 type split. Um, so we start to get into that, but know that when you, when you sign into the device, you are self-identifying. You are identifying who you are based on your gender, your age, set up in your, in your profile. So we do have the ability to target individuals as well. So if you want to run a campaign that was directed to, to males between the age of 25 and 54 with a household income over X, you're able to do those kinds of things on the device. 20.1 million uh, US breakout. I'll just load this slide up here. About 60% are between the ages of 18 and 34. 62% are male, as you saw on the previous slide. 46% are married. And about 60% have a household income over 60K. Um, this is not surprising, obviously. A device like an Xbox or a device like a set-top box is, uh, you know, obviously it's a, it's a high-ticket item when you buy it. But at the same time, um, much like your phones or your tablets, uh, there's, a, there's a lot of content that's available to you that you have to pay for as well. So it's not a, a it's, 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 I would call it, it's a resource intensive type activity. So we see people with that high disposable income that tends to own it. What I want to do quickly is show a quick little video. Are people familiar with what Connect is? Okay, great, great. I, I get varying degrees of response on that. But it's a voice gesture um, control based system. It's a camera based system for the, for the Xbox. We see it in similar devices uh, on the PlayStation. They have a, what they call their, their, mo their move uh, platform, which uses a uh, camera to sort of to sense where you are in space. But the idea is now you've, you've lowered that last barrier for people to entry. It's not always about gaming, right? Obviously, you can do a dance game, you can do a sports game that uses your full body to do that. But you can actually sit on the couch and consume entertainment content by using your hand or your voice to search for content. I like this little short little video uh, because it, it talks about why this the the, 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 plan, the platform itself and the audience is broadening so so vastly uh, over the last few years. Because that that 18 button controller was uh, let's face it, it was a bit. Uh, it was a bit of a non-starter for people that weren't familiar with or hadn't grown up with a console or a controller on hand. And this is a way with the, the connect-based system that we're really breaking down those barriers. So now people are actually comfortable using the device because it's so natural. It's a user, natural user-based uh, control mechanism. So a little video on Connect might get your mind thinking about ways that advertisers could use Connect to uh, this type of technology to reach their consumers or how, in general, how this technology is being used to improve the lives of individuals. You'll see through this video how, these are all real world examples, by the way. You'll see uh, doctors in, a, in an operating room using Connect to go through radiology slides. You'll see a small boy that's using Connect to, to gamify uh, his physical fitness or physical rehab routine. Um, you'll even see some other adaptation in here that might surprise you.
things like Connect are available for the PC. You can actually go out, buy a Connect, hook it up to a computer. We're seeing now that the, the user community, uh, people in academics, are really utilizing this type of technology for things that we've never even thought of, just as the video says. Whether it be uh, you know, helping an autistic child to communicate, whether, you know, because a controller itself, it's very hard for an autistic child in a lot of cases to make a connection between actions on a controller and what they see on the screen. But holding up their hand or using their voice to control seems very natural. So there's a lot of ways we can use this technology. And I, I throw it up there just to sort of, just to, to, to get your mind spinning a little bit. So I mentioned earlier uh, that, that gaming is actually not the predominant activity on a console. So sort of give you an idea of how it breaks out. We have gaming activities, of course. We have social experiences. And we also have entertainment consumption. So about 40% on average, the user is using it for gaming. No surprise, it is a fantastic gaming device. But last year, we saw that the, that the amount of consumption of entertainment actually now has surpassed that of gaming. Now, I will point out, the gaming has not gone down. Gaming's actually increased in that same time frame. But now that you've added all this additional entertainment content, by sheer voice, it's larger than gaming, even though gaming has increased. We're actually seeing double year-over-year -year consumption of entertainment through our apps channels than we did a year ago. In addition to that, and how that breaks out, in case people are curious, watching movies and programs, browsing content on the device, and of course, listening to music. We also have social activities. So Facebook and Twitter are apps that are available on, on, on the Xbox. But over 4 million messages a day are sent between Xbox Live subscribers. So there's ability to send messages while you're gaming. There's ability to send messages um, just using the, the chat pad or with your voice. So there's a lot of, this is the largest social network on the television in the home. And obviously the addition of Facebook and Twitter, you can see how we're really rounding out the ability for people to communicate. So, when we look, when we talk to advertisers, because that's obviously that's what I do, I, I work with advertisers on how to reach their consumers, there are different, different prime times during the day that need to be considered. So obviously the web, right, is the prime time during the work day. When you start to think about that, people get in, in the morning, you can see the blue line is the trend of, of online activity. No surprise, first thing in the morning, they're on their, on their, their computers, there's huge traffic on the web. About that mid-afternoon, though, it starts to trail off when people are winding down their business day. And that's when you see the red line, which is mobile traffic, pick up. So now you're seeing people switch to their phones when they're on their commute, when they're at the dinner table, when they're you know, at home helping the kids with, with their homework. But after dinner, that's when you really see the prime time of console usage. So if you're an advertiser and you're looking to reach somebody throughout the entire day, there are multiple screen screens to be considered here, and that's what I, like, I would like to point out. So prime time for the web, obviously during the day, switching to mobile around that, that, that dinner hour, and finally over to the console for prime time. So I mentioned that the console usage entertainment consumption has doubled year over year. On average, as of December 1st, this past year, uh, a month on our console. And you say, that's, that's, that's a lot, right? That's, you know, that's a week and a half in terms of a work week. But what we saw when, in December when we launched a new dashboard that took the consumption of uh, entertainment content and put it more to an app-based strategy where you could download a Netflix app, a Hulu Plus app, an ESPN app. We just recently launched Comcast Xfinity. You can now download the Xfinity app on the system. So if you're a Comcast subscriber, you can actually watch all the on-demand programming available in the Comcast library on your console. Same with HBO Go. You can see all the HBO content that you previously saw maybe on, on a tablet-based product or a PC-based product. Now you can watch it on the big screen. So we're seeing this consumption dramatically increase just since December, and that number has jumped to 84 hours. So nearly three hours a day people are spending, on average, on the console. And you saw earlier, most of that is actually not gaming, it's entertainment consumption and social experience. It's about 60% on average. And this is an interesting trend too. It's just oddly, I was on the way here today, I was listening to the radio, and they're going through a list of what the Facebook generation will not buy. Okay, so it's the top eight things that the Facebook generation will not buy. 
newspapers, landline phones, those are obviously ones you might think of. But it was interesting, people, uh, the Facebook generation would say that they're not buying TVs anymore. And more specifically, they're not consuming standard broadcast anymore. Because they're getting all their TV on demand, whether it be on their PC, whether it be on their tablet. They're choosing to watch the programming when they want to watch it. And that's what we're seeing here. So again, this is an Xbox stat, but you can apply this to uh, the, the millennial generation for sure. They're, they're watching very little to no TV on that 40% of them, where it starts to trend up. But they're still consuming content, right? We know they're consuming 84 hours a month. So it's because they're watching it through devices like an Xbox or a console or a set-top box, because you have that ability to stream content when you want, content on your, on your time frame. What does an advertising experience look like within the console? Just I'll, I'll quickly blaze through this, but just to show you an idea. When you're on there and you're navigating through the device and you see ad units and you choose to interact with them, whether it be some value exchange, in this case it was a chance to win, um, or it's a play and win, where it brought you to play this game sort of a certain time frame for a chance to win. This was Garnier Fructis. Uh, they had the ability to ask for a sample to be sent to you via mail. Uh, the ability to interact with the brand, you take a hair quiz, you go through there and say, like, oh, this is my, I'm a man, and, you know, whatever, my hair is dry, and it goes you through, it steps you through the whole process. But it's highly interactive and engaging. On average, people are spending about three minutes inside of these advertising experiences. So it's, it goes beyond just the click-through rates that some of the people were looking for, sort of traditional online advertising, into more brand engagement. We can also do things like, you know, uh, actual responses based on your location. In this case, it's an example, run out of Canada for subway. I want to find a local subway. You put in your zip code, and it pulls up a list of all the subways approximate to you. Um, but we can go beyond that now, too. So uh, Microsoft as a whole, you have the Windows Live, ID, right? you use that for Hotmail, you use that for Windows Live Messenger. You use the same Windows Live ID when you sign into a Windows phone, but also the Xbox. So your activities on the web, your, your, your behaviors um, are being tracked. We can sell to advertisers, they, and this is not, not specific to Microsoft, this happens across all of your major uh, internet properties. But we have the ability to sell people based on behaviors. So if you're, let's say, for example, you're looking for a new car. So you've done a search on the internet in the last 30 or 60 days, whatever that look back window is that you set, and you're looking for a new car, whether it be a crossover or a luxury sedan or whatnot, an advertiser can come to us and say, I want to buy those people. All right? I'm trying to sell a car, and I want to have a crossover, and I want to sell them. Great. So we can actually identify the users on the console that have performed internet searches for a crossover in the last 30 or 60 days, and they can actually buy that as a targeted segment of advertising units. Same thing with age and gender and geo, but it goes beyond this, much more into the psychographics and behavior patterns of the consumer. A lot less waste for the advertiser, but frankly, much more relevant advertising content for the individual. You do a search for a trip, you want to take a trip for spring break, you do a couple searches on the internet, you know you start getting hit with a lot of travel ads. That's great because it's, it's relevant to what you're looking for. Whether you're searching for a new PC, you start getting hit with all sorts of tech ads. Same thing here. We want to deliver advertising that's relevant because then it's contextual for the user and they engage much more so. We see our, our interaction rates jump as a result. Let me jump in to the future, right? So we've long since been asking the question, well, in, in, in the TV world, in the broadcast world, I'm sitting down and watching a program, and I see a 30-second TV spot delivered to me. Um, if I wanted to, right, to interact with that brand because that commercial really spoke to me, I have to take action. I go to the internet or I go to the store. Uh, I personally have to go out and perform the action to go find that product, right? There's not really any way for me to do it easily and seamlessly. Well, what we're changing now with the ability, again, because these are identified users, we have the ability now for when you're watching a 30-second spot on Xbox, you can actually interact with the TV spot to ask for more information. The Kinect camera itself has microphones built into it. And as you're watching that TV spot, you can say Xbox, which is the, the key to the device itself to listen to you. And you can say more, I want more information. And what that actually can do is it can happen in a multitude of ways. It can send you an email because we know your email address from your user profile. And we can send you more information via email or send you a text. 
Other examples could be Xbox Tweet. Obviously, a lot of uh, social uh, media people in the room. When you're watching this commercial here for Coca-Cola, we can have an interaction for it. Tweet this comment, right, for Coca-Cola for a chance to win. So sort of a value exchange the advertiser is offering. In this case, Xbox Tweet. It will automatically prepare a canned tweet that you can then post to your, or, or just post to Twitter, or post to your, your Twitter screen. Or Xbox Schedule. In this case, you're watching commercial, you see a commercial come up for The Voice, you're like, ah, you want to remember to watch that? Now, if I'm watching TV traditionally, I could go into the channel guide and I could search for that and I could find it and set a reminder or set a report. In this case, you could say Xbox Schedule and it would instantly place it into your calendar. Right, because we can link it, send you an invitation to your in, to your inbox that you can accept, and now it's on your calendar. These are just different ways in which advertisers can create opportunities for interaction. And finally, near me. Right, so there'll be a whole host of different com commands that users can can use. In this case, it's an advertisement for a Toyota Prius. You can say Xbox near me, and we'll pull up a list of dealerships that are approximate to your location. So there'll be a whole host of these types of interactions coming out later this summer. And finally, the app providers. And this is where the, the whole conversation really begins to change because the device itself is no longer um, about what we as a company are going to go out and source and put into our content uh, or our catalog of content. We can partner with uh, third parties to develop an app for the service that will then allow them to control the content that's served. I mentioned uh, Xfinity, I mentioned HBO Go, a whole host of other ones like ESPN, TMZ, UFC. Like for example, the UFC app. You can watch, obviously, UFC fights through the UFC app, but you can actually choose to watch them uh, with your friends, meaning they're at home in their respective locations. We're all watching this fight together. We can hear and communicate with each other uh, using the service. So all different ways in which we're making not just content available, but content better and through this type of, of, of an arrangement. So I don't want to jump ahead because I really want to leave time for questions. So please, fire away. Let me just grab the mic. There you go. Um, hi. Um, so suppose I am a business owner and I'm trying to market this product. How would I go about having an interactive ad de being delivered through the Xbox? Do I have to go directly to Microsoft? Or do you have certified certified like um, distributors or um, marketing people that you go to to get the, the ad on the Xbox? How does yeah, that work? and that's that's what I do, right? So uh, so if you're looking to run an advertisement uh, for you know, your business in a particular area, uh, you reach out to the Xbox advertising team like myself. Uh, however, there is another way to do it. Um, if you were to, let's say, go to ESPN, um, an advertisement I see a lot on ESPN, a local company, 5-Hour Energy. If you're 5-Hour Energy and you want to buy a run of ESPN, those advertisements within the Xbox console itself, as you're watching uh, content on Xbox but on the ESPN app, you'll actually see advertisements that are sold by ESPN. It's blind. You can't say I want to buy ESPN Xbox only, all right, but it's a run of type buy. So you'd actually be running on the console even though you were doing a broadcast buy if you're doing that, that run of. But for the most part, you reach out to someone like myself. Um, so I have a follow up question. Yeah. So currently um, in, on online, when somebody wants to advertise, um, um, I can just create my own banner, I can create my own YouTube video, and I can have that embedded as a banner. So that's how traditional advertising works sure. on the internet. Everybody can be accessible to everybody. Yeah. Is Microsoft open, opening up the platform in the future so that the actual advertisers could develop their own advertising and you know, advertisements and push it through the platform? Is that something that's going to happen? I, we have advertisers all the time that will create ads to our specification and then we will run it on the service. It's not going to be a self-service type thing where you can upload your ads to some sort of a, a service that would then go live. Um, I mean, you may have heard there are obviously competitors of ours that you know, had issues with um, 
uh, security access and a breach and a lot of user information was scraped and credit card information. So it's very much a walled garden. So we have to ingest your ad to make sure that it's that it's you know obviously it's, it's okay and it meets all our security parameters and then it will go live. But we have advertisers all the time that create their ad units. Uh, they can actually give to us a 30 second TV spot and we can run that live on the service. We will just reformat it in the appropriate. Uh, size parameters for our for the service so, thank you yeah. more questions <coughs> the network apps um, are people viewing them live or is that just on demand it depends on the app so uh, xfinity currently is you have, we have access to their entire on demand catalog however later this year um, you know, we, we hope to have that service go live, meaning if you are an Xbox or me, an Xfinity subscriber, you'll be able to watch live TV through your console, essentially using the console as your set-top box. Currently, however, you have access to their on-demand content um, through the service. Do you know if PBS has a they do not, as of right now. There, there are several apps that are that are certainly in development. There are about 40 to 40, I think 45, 40 or 50 apps that are available on the service globally. And our plan is to have 100 live on the service by the end of the year. There are a lot of apps that are in development right now, and they keep that very much uh, until they're ready to be released to to for certification. We don't know about them much in advance. There were a handful of apps that we knew about before. They launch like MLB.tv, uh, Comcast, and HBO Go, uh, but because that was a, for a press release between the joint companies, but for the most part, we'll know about them 30 to 60 days before they launch. I don't know the PBS one right now. And these are all national, they're not local at all? Yeah. Uh, some of the apps are global, but Lo local. Local. Oh, local. local. No, they would all be national. <clears throat> Hi. Um, been reading a lot about like how Siri is kind of changing the search engine um, theory of how people are going to find stuff. What's your take on that as far as you guys have the uh, commands coming out, like you said earlier this summer? Or? Yeah. I actually didn't even get into it, but there's a whole section of Xbox where you can use your voice with Bing. So you can actually go to a whole Bing page on Xbox and just be like, uh, you know, being Harry Potter, and it will pull up every single instance of Harry Potter that's available to you on the console. But it's using the Bing search engine. It is right? using the Bing okay. search engine. Yes, correct. So uh, currently, in, in the search capability is limited to the to the content that's available on the console. It does not go out to the internet and search the internet. Uh, obviously, things are always changing, and hopefully later this year you might see something updating that technology even further. But uh, that's Again, we, we always look at things in terms of a phased approach. So when you look at Xbox, one of the challenges of any set-top box, any on-demand service, is accessing and finding content. There's so much content there. I don't know if you're a Comcast subscriber or not the dog, and that might be a great service. I have it myself. But it's hard to find content sometimes because you don't know where within the service to search. That's how something like being searched really changes that because it would find all instances. If I just said Harry Potter and gave no more information, we would pull up all the game content related to Harry Potter. There's Harry Potter Lego, there's Harry Potter you know, games themselves with 360, but all the movies and all that other stuff, or even additional content behind the scenes, anything that's tagged with that metadata will be brought up in the service. Okay, I don't know if this is a silly question. So, why would you have an Xbox without a TV? Because you said that generation doesn't, TVs are going by, but right. you, you use it on a TV, right? That's correct. Okay, so, so does my son. And the next question is, I mean, if you have a TV, I have a cable box in that room, of course, because there's a TV in that room. So are you saying I'm going to get rid of my cable box and he's going to use his Xbox? Yeah, actually, that's what we're seeing. The, the cord cutters, as we collectively call them, people are, are foregoing subscription-type services like Comcast or, uh, or or other subscription services because they have chosen they want to pay. There's, right, there's enough content out there that you can get it on demand on your time frame that you may not need the traditional scheduled programming of a, of a cable or a, a, a 
direct TV type provider. So yes, millennials are very much at the forefront of that cord cutting. As far as the television itself, uh, I just, you know, again, it was just something I heard on the radio and Wayne. I assume they mean TV with a connection, right? They don't actually mean the device itself. Um, so, so then in turn, if you get rid of TV connection and yeah. you're using your Xbox, that is the only way those users are going to see ads is buying ads. Well, correct. Yes and no, because again, it's, it's ads that we serve, right, to our, our, to our user base. But also that all of the apps that we allow onto the service, they themselves may have their own ads as well that someone may buy directly through them. So uh, ESPN is a great example. We actually just announced a partnership last week. We'll actually be serving ads into the ESPN <laughs> app itself. Whereas right now, the ads that you see within ESPN are only sold by ESPN. So I think you're gonna, and it always is gonna depend on the app because we have different arrangements with all of them. Um, but you're going to start to see, I believe, a combination for most of those apps just because it's a great way for them to leverage our sales force and their sales force to sell their inventory. Um, I have two questions. The first question is, suppose ESPN would not allow you to put uh, advertisement into their channel in your app. In that case, do they pay you or you pay them to have the app in your, in your Xbox. And the second question is, um, so this is kind of similar to say Samsung having like the, the apps on their screens, or it's kind of maybe like what Apple's uh, ITV would be like where they can have use the iPhone like the Xbox or something like that? Sure. As far as the, you know, the, the revenue share agreements, and I, I really can't speak to that because I think they're different for every single advertiser. I think there are apps that 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 content provider wants on our console because they want to attract their user base and they may pay to be on the service. And then there are others that we as a company want on the service because it's really a tentpole type uh, you know, service that we may pay them. I can't speak to those financial arrangements. I really don't know. Um, and as far as the, yeah, the Apple TV or apps, smart TVs with apps, yeah, I mean, it's content providers are looking to make their content available anywhere, the whole theory of TV anywhere, right? Uh, we are just one more of those channels. Um, I think I referenced the other, the other devices that do that because I think we tend to forget about devices that have been in market for you know, nearly a decade now in favor of what's new. I mean. You, know, you look at Google TV and Apple TV, the Xbox itself is greater than all those combined because it's nearly 70 million devices globally. So that's why I mention it because I think we always start to think about what's new and what's out there. We forget about what's been around and what's working. And this is definitely one of those devices. Any more questions? Um, I have two questions that are pretty much unrelated. The first one is you said that you could use Xbox Live to take the place of a service uh, such as Time Warner or um, Comcast. Is there an additional charge for such a service beyond what somebody that's just playing games would, would have? And can you only access things from an Xbox? So for example, with Comcast service, you can get email uh, through a laptop or other device. Sure. So, uh, to your first question, uh, the uh, I'm sorry. Would you repeat the first question again? I want to make sure I want to fully understand. You're talking about okay. Uh, I'll, I'll be a little more specific. Uh, I have a 14 year old son who plays Xbox a lot. He pays, I believe, it's 60 dollars a year for Xbox oh, Live. Yeah. Okay. Does he have to if if we want to go if we want to access internet, entertainment and other uh, content through the Xbox? Is there an additional charge for that? Yes. And does it, and does it uh, does the service extend to laptops and other devices similar to what a provider like Comcast would offer? Correct. Correct. So if I uh, if I'm on Xbox and I want to say download the Hulu Plus app, if I don't have a Hulu Plus subscription, I can't see the content. I have to have that additional subscription. If I have a Hulu Plus subscription, I simply put in the credentials, and now that becomes another device within my family of devices that I can access that content from. Does that make sense? So if I have Netflix, 
I can access Netflix on my device. It does not cost me any more money to access Netflix on my, my device versus my computer or my phone or my tablet. It's just one more device that I have authorized to access that same subscription service. So if there's a subscription service that exists, then that subscription service would have, you have to have that in order to, to, to watch it on Xbox. There are people out there that don't have the full gold level subscription of Xbox. So there's Xbox Live Silver. Xbox Live Silver. Mike went off. See if you can turn it back on. I'll just scream because that was scary. Uh, so the Xbox, uh, Xbox service, there's Xbox Live and Xbox Gold. And if you don't have Xbox Live Gold, which is $60 a year, then you're not going to be able to access some of those subscription-based apps because that's part of having the gold subscription. As far as uh, email communication, uh, no, currently the Xbox app for Comcast is the Xfinity app, which is really the television content. I have Xfinity app on other devices that you can access uh, email and you can see voicemails, that type of stuff. That's not the service we're talking about here for the Xbox. It's purely the, the television-based content. Okay. Thank you. And my other question, there's lots of targeted marketing, marketing for uh, people that uh, use the web on a their computer. And typically uh, what uh, companies are doing is using cookies to track uh, a user's uh, interest. Yep. Some people prefer not to participate in that to the extent that they can limit it. They may have privacy concerns. They may get tired of seeing certain ads. And you can manage your cookies in your browser and maybe not turn that stuff off completely, but uh, you can certainly uh, limit it quite a bit. Uh, does the Xbox Live also use a cookie-based technology? And is it possible to limit it uh, on your Xbox Live subscription? Yeah, actually, within the settings, you can turn off advertising. Um, but to your point about the cookies, we actually we use the, the, the Windows Live ID for that. So when you look at uh, someone's online behaviors, if I just turn on my computer and I start surfing the web, I, you know, we, technically Microsoft, we don't, uh, you're not signed in, we're not, we're not, we're, we don't know that information, right? So that's how we're able to track your behaviors there and then port that over to Xbox. But if you want to turn off advertising, and we actually call out advertising on the service. It actually says advertising on it. So you know, if you you don't want to interact with it, you certainly don't have to. It takes up one of small several small files on the screen. It's your choice. Thank you very much. No pop-ups. I think we have time for one more. And we have a burning question. All right, there we go. You, um, I work with the Ann Arbor Symphony, and I'm trying really hard to reach the younger demographic by bringing video games live here. Um, do you guys, for nonprofit, do you offer any type of deal for nonprofit? You're specifically looking to get access to, to games? Is that what you're asking? No, I want to advertise. Oh, I, I'm a gamer. I know the service. I love it. Yeah. And I know who I want to reach on here. But I'm afraid to ask for the ballpark. <laughs> I got you. I got you. Well, let's talk offline because um, you know, although we we don't have anything uh, necessarily like a, a, a you know a sponsorship type deal, we can, we can talk about it and just give you some information on what it would be. Okay. I have a quick question. Is there Brad? Is there a recommended? piece of the media pie that you suggest people go to Xbox with? Because obviously you're dealing with a bunch of different places. Yeah. How much of that money goes to video gaming in your recommendation? You know, honestly, it's, it's uh, we're trying to figure that out. I mean, I, and I, I only, I, I don't mean to dodge the question. What I mean is, if you look at the total spend, media spend, you look at what's digital, you start to ask the question, is this digital or is this broadcast? Because frankly, the line is getting really blurry. So if we look at what is the total spend, you know, I have that, that chart up there, sort of the prime time hours of, of online, mobile, and, and gaming, or gaming or console based. It's not getting its, its fair share based on its total consumption. You're talking 84 hours a month on average. Uh, you start to compare that to you know, online activity. Uh, I would say that it's definitely not, not getting the share that it should at this point. 
But I, then I start to question whether or not it's even all digital at all, because we really should be talking to some of the broadcast partners as well, right? The people that buy broadcast spots, buy you know, the, the TV pods. So I can't give you an answer, but it should be. So it's evolving. Yeah, well, because I, I see your presentation would convince people on why they should be putting more money into this, yeah. right? Because that is a lot of hours <coughs> in front of the council. Oh, well, one well, last little question. Two questions. Um, so a user on Twitter asks, his name is John, and he wants to know, um, cloud devices like tablets can perform many of these same functions, so what are the benefits of being tied to a console rather than a tablet or another device? Well, I would argue from the get-go that you can have the same capabilities. I mean, if you're talking about Yes, you can get you know, Hulu and that type of content onto a tablet device. Yes, absolutely you can. Again, it goes back to the theory of the best device available. If I'm sitting on my couch and I have got a 55 inch TV in front of me, I'm gonna choose to watch a movie in surround sound through my TV, not through my tablet. If I'm in an airport, hey, tablet's the best opportunity for me. So again, it's, it's all about where users want their content not, a, not as a, and we're, not, we're just going to be another channel for how they get that content. I guess that's completely disregarding the fact that in, even as a gaming device, 40% of the time spent there, there's no comparison with a, with a first generation you know, the console versus a tablet in terms of the type of gaming activity you can do. Certainly can't do any sort of connect based activities on the tablet. Good answer. All right, let's give Brad Man a big round of applause. Stand up and introduce yourself. Give us your name, rank, and serial number. Uh, ten words or less, and then pass the mic to your friend. Uh, Tom Pavlak with a little company called Poco Labs up in Milford, doing product and service development, research, and design. And uh, Dave Skelly with Poco Labs as well. Don't know what Tom just said. Noah Babcock, 360 Interactive. We're a digital marketing agency helping businesses bring more lead sales today. Good afternoon. Frank of Lange with, sorry, with Xenocomp. We are a Microsoft solution provider dealing in uh, network services as well as custom software development. Hi, Mike Wynn with Sandler Training here in Ann Arbor. Uh, I've got a question for you. How many people here use Salesforce.com or are looking at Salesforce.com? Anybody? Okay, then I won't even talk about our Salesforce.com user group that we're forming, but I'll talk to Stacey. Okay. Rick Bollinger with Menlo Park Software. Hi, Stacey with Dallin Miller, your local digital print shop, and we love to help nonprofits save money and look good. Uh, Amy Ma, we're doing a website for publishing children's books in multiple languages. Hi, my name is Jennifer Ashman. I'm a marketing instructor here at the law school at U of M. I'm Lisa Radley. I'm an urban professional. also doing some consulting. My specialties are consumer products, uh, sales analysis, and licensing. Hi, I'm Julie Mosley, and I'm a financial professional seeking new opportunities. I'm Nick Mosley, I'm here with her, and I'm with Imola America. <coughs> uh, I'm Jason Kohler from Islamic Public Schools. I'm the teacher of the Islamic Positive Success Initiative, and I'm here with one of my students to get some information for some of his interviews this summer. <laughs> I'm John David, I'm here at the information. Hey everybody, I'm Hyde of the Ride. Uh, if anybody wants information about our new air ride shuttle to the airport, uh, public transit to and from DTW, $12 each way, round trip for 20 bucks. Come see me afterwards, thanks. Uh, you can also go to the ride.org for information about our fixed route buses and myairride.com about air ride, thanks. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jim Musio. I am uh, with a company called Knowledge Digital. We're here at Local Event Armor, and we are a web and mobile development company. Hi, I'm Amy Maynard. I'm also with Knowledge Digital. Hey everyone, I'm Tom Hansen. Hi, and Tom Cadet. Uh, I intern with 37 Designs. I'm Roger Rail. I do the video here and some other places. Like tonight, I'll be at the Detroit New Tech, the 
Madison building uh, where they have five young companies come in and talk for five minutes what their business plan is and then get hammered for another five minutes by the 90 people in the audience. Um, events. Um, this weekend is Water Hill Music Festival. How many have been to a, a lot of the first one last year? Nobody? It's a local, it's a neighborhood uh, in Ann Arbor bounded by like Miller, Spring, and Sunset. It's up near the water plant, that's why it's called Water Hill. And there's 70 music acts in six hours. About 50 hours of music. And it's neighborhood people. They have to, somebody in the group has to be in the neighborhood. So there's like people who are in bands trying to find somebody <laughs> they know. It, you know, there was, a, there was a joke about it like, you know, who's, who's got a bass player that, that lives in Water Hill so we can have our band? So there's really big names there, but, but there's also this neighborhood kids playing. So that's Sunday, uh, from 2 to 6. Uh, there's an e cycle event this Saturday. If you got any old electronics, uh, you can recycle it at uh, Pioneer. And let's see what else is going on. I think that's enough now. Hi, I'm Dennis Kukinski. I do sales and marketing and also help Roger out with the video. Hi, my name is Ricardo Rodriguez. Um, I am a co founder at U Trivia. U Trivia is a global startup founded by University of Michigan students. And we are creating tools that allow anybody to create online interactive experiences without taking, you know, how to program it. Video games live here. So, anybody who wants to hear more, come in. I have a lot of friends with the Detroit Public Television. We have a HD production truck that can electrify any of your events, also promoting on air. Hello, my name is Carl Schwartz. I'm a recent MBA graduate, and uh, I've been looking around town for opportunities in marketing research. Somebody will be tweeting, God willing, and um, yeah, tweet it. It's going to be a good one. So come on out next week, and thanks for being here. See you next time.